Hey folks, welcome to the October edition. Pretty sure. Oh yes, based on based on the apparel in this call, it is definitely October. The October edition of the IPFS local offline collaboration special interest group, whatever this thing is called, where we talk about offline first meets D-Web kinds of topics. Um, so we're happy to have everybody here. And we have a couple of people I think that haven't been on this call before. So if we can just go around really quickly, introduce yourself and kind of what you work on and why you're interested in this space of making stuff work offline. Um, I can get us started. I'm Terry. I currently work at Protocol Labs and I am working on a platform called Proto School, which teaches decentralized web protocols, it tries to keep it beginner friendly. Um, but I got here by way of the Offline First community. I'm the organizer of an event called Offline Camp, which we'll talk about more in a minute. And I've also done stuff with CouchDB and progressive web apps in that the more traditional side of Offline First space. Uh, I will go this way on my screen. Dietrich, you're up. Hi, everybody. My name is Dietrich Ayala. I work at PL. I'm working on IPFS in web browsers, mostly. And uh, I'm interested in several offline topics. And lately in that world, we've been talking about things like offline co-hosting of Wikipedia and some other things. And I added a, an agenda item to talk about after Offline Camp. And Lytle. I work at PL. Uh, on IPFS in web browsers, I'm uh, maintaining browser extension, uh, and recently working on embedded JS IPFS in Brave without third-party software. And I'm really interested in making that side of our technical stuff uh, stuck, uh, supporting like offline use cases, which I believe I will have some notes later on that. Sure. Cool. Now, David just came back and it moved what is clockwise on my screen. So I'm just going to have to start fresh and invent something new. We're going to go Yanis now. Hello. Hi. Hello. I'm Yanis. Um, I am working at UCL and I'm also an advisor at um, Protocol Labs. Um, I have been working in the area of mobile communications and delay tolerant networks for um, almost a decade. It's been a very hot interest in my list. Um, so I'm really interested to see what is going on in terms of development. Uh, we've got a few proof of concept prototypes that are working in this kind of mode, um, integrating some of IPFS-like things but not quite exactly um so yeah i'm interested to hear what others are working on where this is going and yeah what is the interest awesome david is your uh audio working today for you to introduce yourself insert pause here do, 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 do. or you can type an introduction and i'll read it if you want to type one in the chat field in the meantime i will go to michael Oh, hi, everybody from the Oregon forest that I'm definitely in right now. Uh, I'm Michael Burns. I work at PL as well. Um, I came uh, from an open source um, kind of self-hosting um, background and had some interest in like data sovereignty. And so the, the offline first uh, kind of mindset meshes with that rather nicely. Um, so that's my perspective on the world. And Dominic? Yeah, sure. So I work at Protocol Learn Labs, uh, particularly on Google IPFS. And what I do is I like to think about how to integrate that with other systems. So like the operating system or maybe your service or something like that. And that is something that I do day to day. And I like to come to these meetings because I want to see what other people are doing that kind of falls in line with you know, some of our values and, and goals and things like that. So I, li I like to see what other people are doing. And I also want to see if there's any way that I can help push that stuff along forward. So that's me. Awesome. So the, the key item on our agenda today is to chat a little bit about the stuff that we talked about at Offline Camp. And hey, he's here. 
Is your is your audio working? Let's see. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Tell us about yourself. Sorry. Introduce yourself. Ah, okay. I'm David, a full stack programmer. I mainly use Laravel and Vue.js, and I am uh, starting with offline technologies like CoachDB and and other ones. I'm just uh, discovered the Orbit DB, and I want to start learning about it. And that's all for now. Awesome. Thank you. Yes, I'm muted. Thank you, Zoom, for that helpful pop-up reminder when I was noisy and not talking to all of you. Um, I was hope there are a couple other people who I was hoping to have share their their insights today, but they had conflicts. So we can certainly catch up with them on our next call if they're able to join us then. But uh, Michael and I were both at offline camp, which took place the last weekend of September in the great state of Oregon, where Michael hails from. Um, yes, very fancy. And the event, just for folks who haven't heard about it before, is focused on offline first, um, more broadly, so making technology that works in bad network conditions, whether that's intermittent or primarily just offline. Sometimes it's about uh, syncing with CouchDB and PouchDB, and sometimes it's about IoT, and sometimes it's about uh, mesh networking for disaster recovery. There are a lot of different angles um, that we see when people come to offline camp. They bring really cool stories from um, you know, healthcare in the developing world to all kinds of stuff. Um, but on this call, we're here to talk about kind of the stuff that crosses over between D-Web specific stuff and that offline first. So kind of a subset of the things we talked about at camp. And I will just call out that Michael and I each, Michael attended more than I did of these sessions because I was running around doing lots of logistics. But um, we, this is sort of an unconference format, all discussion based, not presentation. So we were um, nominating as a group what we wanted to talk about and breaking into smaller groups. So we've each attended some of the sessions over the course of our time at camp. And then we are working on having folks who attended camp write up uh, summaries of most of those discussion topics. So if you follow our Medium publication, which I have the link to in the notes, then you can stay tuned and hopefully see a little bit more of that content as time goes on. And if you see a topic in one of those articles that you think would be nice to surface on a call and I'll chat about, please feel free to propose something. This is all uh, audience proposed topics for these calls, so feel free to let me know. Um, but I thought we could just kind of, Michael, if you wanna maybe start and share some of the conversations that you found particularly interesting or that stood out to you. Um, and this doesn't need to be just us sort of summarizing the discussion. I, I'd be very happy to have other people kind of jump in and see what, what that sparks in this group. Um, yeah, so just to kind of emphasize, um, this is my first offline, uh, first camp and first kind of introduction to that community. So I kind of went in uh, wide-eyed wide -eyed and bushy-tailed. Um, and as is true of both tech conferences, like, there were, is a pretty small one, they had to reschedule, so there's a couple dozen people. Um, all of them kind of, their own background, their own context of getting here, all of them crazy passionate about this stuff. Um, and so we, we quite literally just nerded out for hours. Um, a couple of the really cool talks we had, um, do some highlights. Uh, a, a representative um, that works with uh, homeless, uh, trans troubled um recently or uh frequent uh jail uh inhabitants like the the rough edges of people who are struggling uh in the new york uh, metro area came and talked about um tools they need the the kind of workflow the kind of um the whole new set of challenges of kind of how do you teach someone how to do a computer or use a smartphone app when they're not necessarily technically literate beyond, you know, they know about the internet or whatever. Um, but they also have like more pressing things going on in their lives. They don't have lots of spare cash. They don't have um, necessarily a home or a place to keep like longings. Um, 
don't necessarily trust all the civic resources around them, uh, et cetera, et cetera. That was a really incredible talk, um, a good chunk of which got notes um, and possibly recorded. So I think we'll be able to expand on some of that um, and I won't just keep talking about it. Um, the other two topics that were really, really interesting, one was trying to find some alignment uh, around incentives of social networks. Um, in particular, the idea of uh, wouldn't it be great if there was some kind of a karma incentive, insert term here, um, for people who summarize um, the context of something. So often you'll get on the internet and there's a scandal or there's some hubbub going on and you don't know what it is and you don't necessarily want to dig into it, but it doesn't necessarily rise to the the New York Times is going to write an article about it, and so you can get the rundown from them. Um, it would be great if there was a way of uh, rewarding people who can kind of summarize, give you some context on um, the inner turmoil and and uh, discussions of a community without having to dig into every person's back and forth. Um, a lot of that in the context of Twitter and Secure Scuttlebutt. Uh, and then finally, the pure tech side, um, I hope I'm not going too long or too high level. Um, there's a great discussion on um, a number of people worked in the field in rural um, and disconnected communities, particularly in Africa. Um, and so there was just an open design discussion of, okay, how do you make a chat application um, in, in a disconnected part of the world? Um, so pick your tech stack, what does that look like? Do you choose existing things? Are you using APIs? Is it mobile? Is it, um, um, what do you call that, uh, native? Um, and all the, the scaling issues and all the things that come of that. Um, but this was, a, a person had that problem, they were gonna leave camp and then go start working on their new prototype. Um, and they had come up with a rough design of what they wanted to do. Uh, and it was just an open discussion of, okay, if you had to go build a chat app for people who, potentially had feature phones in the past, but possibly not, um, have no reliable telecom connection, but possibly have an unreliable one. Um, what does that look like? What does that tech stack look like? How do you deploy updates? How do you like get discovery working? All of those like UI, UX things that you can't just go find on Reddit or Hacker News and like click the link and join, um, like give a valid email address and you'll be signed up right away. Um, just a really interesting set of technical challenges um, that open up so many interesting doors, um, but that need to be addressed kind of uh, on day one, right? You have to get your design right before you start committing to sending people and installing features and all these things. Uh, because if you have to sign a new build and distribute that, and it's all on USB stick, updating every single client becomes really problematic, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it was a crazy good discussion. I could happily keep going, but I suspect I, I'm talking too long, so I will stop there. Um, but a great high level and like diverse range of topics. I was really, really happy. Neat. Zoom again tells me I'm muted. Um, I'll share a couple of quick thoughts and then we can circle back and dive further into any of these topics that people are interested to hear a little more about if Michael and I actually remember more about them. Um, one of the things that was interesting to me is the person who Michael mentioned who came in was talking about the, um, like the transient and trans and troubled kind of folks in the New York City area, that person was in a different discussion about, um, about developing world applications for Offline First. And one of the, it, it, so far at Offline Camp, most of the people who come to camp who are working pretty much exclusively on applications that are used in the developing world, whether that's healthcare, et cetera, are folks who are based in Europe or the United States and aren't really tied themselves to the culture there. So there was a lot of talk about like, how do you understand the culture that you're building for enough to build the right solution for them? And do you need to be hiring UX professionals or user researchers who are already there to even, like you're probably asking the questions the wrong way if you're not a member of that community. So they were expressing that this is like this spe very specific cultural group within New York and the cultural group in the developing world situations have that similar thing of the people right now who are trying to build solutions for them aren't the people who quite understand the problems thoroughly. And it's, it's very interesting. 
um, to see how that plays out. I think that's something we run into a lot in Offline First because for me, the real life, like day-to-day -day experience of wanting to stuff to work while I'm offline is like, oh, I'm on the subway. It would, it's obnoxious that my game doesn't work right now. Those kinds of things, not critical, critical stuff. Whereas there are a lot of folks who are suffering from a lot more infrastructure issues where we don't think about the chain. Like I don't think about, oh, the power went off and now there's no router. And then that caused like this trickle down um, of effects from an infrastructure side. So that's always one of the things that's most interesting for me to hear. Um, and then, as I said, I didn't get into a lot of the discussions because I was running around so much, but one of the ones that I was in part of was about the user experience of Offline First, which uh, because of the nature of the group turned out to be more about the user experience of um, DWeb. And I, there was this interesting parallel that came up, up where when I'm thinking in sort of a traditional web sense about whether you're offline or online, I'm thinking of either like online, the network is working, I can go to all the websites, or I'm completely disconnected, I might know why, like I turned my Wi-Fi off and my cell doesn't have service or something like that. There's also a Li-Fi state that people miss and it really affects the way that you need to build an application um, to use cache data first before you try to get new stuff. So your device thinks it has a useful connection, but it doesn't and it keeps trying to get the new information. It won't load cache data because it thinks it's connected, but it's not giving you anything useful. So that's kind of the scale that I'm used to thinking about um, in terms of what offline means. And I'm used to thinking about user patterns for like, okay, your, your data is safe locally, but it hasn't been connected kind of to the cloud yet or to whatever the central database is, the shared database, whatever, um, and thinking about messages for that. But in this conversation, it really became apparent that the whole concept of like what it means to be offline or what it means to be online is totally different when you get into peer to peer. Is it like, is having one other peer with you, now you're online, is it, about a number of peers that you have available to you is like the equivalent of your uh, little bars on your Wi-Fi symbol. Like what's the, what's the scale on which we're judging connectedness in a peer-to-peer -peer kind of situation? It was an interesting conversation. Um, and there were some discussions about like models, like lakes connected by little rivers and stuff like this that people were trying to use to visualize it. But I will leave that to the author of the summary to explain better because that was only in for part of the conversation. But um, that was interesting that it felt like a whole different, like a whole different discussion about what it means to be on and offline. Even there, even though there are certainly some similar implications for how you have to convey state, maybe it's different states that exist that you have to convey. So that was one of the topics that was interesting to me. Um, what of the things we've mentioned would people like to hear more about or chat more about or share ideas about? Yeah, Dietrich. I was listening to Mr. Burns so intently that I forgot to take notes, but I, I do have questions. Ooh. I, I, I was really interested Ooh. in, in you know, both, of, both of you have talked about these higher level use cases and how there's like this ver the spectrum of different technologies we can use to address them. And I was wondering if like if there if there were notes or if people kind of like started to condense those into a set of best practices or recommendations for certain use cases for use case X where you have partial connectivity or dodgy connectivity. Uh, or was there a recommended uh, architectural approach or a set of things that people identified had worked for them uh, for things that are fully offline or like that whole like uh, I'm on a I'm on a disconnected network together with other disconnected people seems to be a, a common use case. Um, so, so things like that, what were the, what were the conclusions at the end? Um, there are notes um, and I will be summarizing from memory, but there, we did record uh, all this stuff so we can dive a little deeper. Um, some of the takeaways were <clears throat> uh, Bluetooth like doesn't work in a, a production ready, like host to host, all of the, there's a Bluetooth, 
I forget what it's called, like service discovery or some various subsets of the Bluetooth protocol, which are generally just acknowledged by this handful of developers, I have not used it firsthand, um, just didn't work. Um, so when we were talking about designing a chat stack, uh, it was essentially go Android only and use whatever, they have like a, a, a local peer discovery API, which uses like audio tones outside of human perception, and then Bluetooth, and then Wi-Fi Direct as a kind of cohesive tech stack. Apple has a similar thing, which is same, same, but different and incompatible. Uh, and the idea was just give up, pick one platform and go all in on that platform. Um, so things like uh, Wi-Fi and like uh, ad hoc networks got used, but are super awkward. You don't want the central like have a Raspberry Pi that becomes your router or whatever. Um, so there are definitely pain points there. Uh, that didn't necessarily have answers so much as uh, workarounds, I guess. Um, yeah, I think that was probably the the biggest takeaway. Um, obviously, there's lots of uh, couch DB love of way of syncing states, um, and like once once the network side works, the software side seems simple, um, but the hardware side of like we have two handsets that we want to share. Uh, any form of data with is like just above broken. So the biggest demo, hopefully I'm not like spoiling any big reveals on our media blog. The coolest demo Teasers we saw- Teasers are good. Was, You'll make people want to read and watch videos. There we go. Uh, a high level teaser. Uh, oh, Louis. The best demo of the, yeah. yeah Louis, uh, who you've met, some of you have met before. on this call. Uh, super cool person gave a demo of, you have two phones, um, like, how do you get them to talk to each other if you don't know their tech stack, you don't have an app installed? Um, so it's a little local web page, which um, uses uh, full screen 2D barcodes um, on one screen and the camera on the phone on the other screen and you point them at each other. So the screen that's showing barcodes flashes maybe five a second, 10 a second, whatever. And it essentially frames of data, which is checkable because of the, the 2D barcode, uh, and then a camera that just parses all those with a library. Um, and it is shocking how reliable and cross-platform that is compared to the other like service discovery, MDNS, yada 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 tech pieces, um, which like work in demos or if you have the same platform app, but doesn't work if you have an old Android and a brand new iPhone or some some mix and match of those. Um, so hopefully that's in the area of what you're asking about, Dietrich. Yeah, I can expand on that a little bit. And I'm actually going to sh share my screen as part of this just to show you that this resource exists. So as people have written for the offline camp medium publication, I've done some categorizing. And some of it would get at the question that you're asking. So for example, in the less so this time than in the past, but we usually have a huge contingent of folks who are really excited about CouchDB and PouchDB for mobile sync. So this could be as part of a progressive web app, for example. So certainly like that mobile sync thing, if you're dealing with a traditional web app as opposed to decentralized, that's a pattern that you'll find pretty well documented. And then the use of service workers as part of a PWA is well documented across like, PWA, that term is much better known than offline first. And so progressive web apps and service workers are a pattern for traditional web apps that are much easier to find information on than I think you would on some of the web stuff. So there are clumps of articles here. And then there are some things here about UX um, with a little discussion of design patterns and how to think about so here's, for example, how do you deal with notifications when you're offline or um, helping people troubleshoot in those situations. There is, I would have to dig to find it unless I put the, unless I managed to put the photo in here, but there's a company that made a poster after one of these camps about like design principles that they kind of, it was essentially a summary of a discussion that we had at camp, which is really cool. Let's see if I can hunt that down. We've had a lot of people talk about developing world use cases and their, I think, infrastructure is the biggest thing that I in my everyday life don't anticipate. Um, 
but the other piece that's not exclusively related to this, um, but disaster recovery, which could be, um, could obviously happen in the States as well, but I think a lot of folks in other places have mesh networking situations that they're using that work really well for communicating. You know, when we have a big disaster, the phone lines go down just from overuse, it seems like. Um, so there's that kind of stuff that you'll find here. Um, so a few different, there are a few different kind of common themes that come out like that. I do think, I feel like there was an effort, or at least the suggestion of an effort to kind of codify a bit more, like what counts as offline first? What, you know, one of the things I encountered, um, because the, maybe because the audience was so deweb heavy was like hanging too much onto this word, but like the combination of offline and first in that order. Um, I think there's a lot of misperception about what that term means. And as someone who has met the, the team at Neighborhoodie that coined the term, I can share just my perspective on it, which mine kind of grows out from a progressive web app perspective, but it's not about uh, being able to use the thing offline the first time that you see it, like with a native app, with a where you'd have to go to the app store, like with a PWA, you're going to have to be online once to get that app, get the kind of functionality downloaded, cache the stuff that's most important. And that's one of the important things that comes up in some of these conversations is it's your responsibility as a developer to help the end user conserve resources, whether that's space on their device or bandwidth or whatever. And it might be that different people have different resources available to them. Maybe one thing is one resource is more expensive to them than another. So we've talked about ideas like, could you set a switch where they can prioritize bandwidth or prioritize battery or something like that? Is it if you know how those things get drained by your application? So we have ideas like that um, from a design perspective, but it's really like loading cached resources first to put the user experience first on those subsequent visits is the way that I describe offline first to people. Um, there were a lot of people at this event that prefer the term local first. Um, at least one of them said it's because offline has a negative connotation and local doesn't. Um, I don't know how many, maybe for like random humans in the world, local might have a like nice kind neighborhood vibe. I don't know how many people in the world think of local as on device, which is the more programming way to think of it. Um, and then one of the other things you asked Dietrich was about like this, like a bunch of people connected to each other, but not connected to the rest of the world. You will find some articles in the medium publication from past events about things like pirate boxes. I don't know if you've seen that technology before. Like there are some devices that are meant to like, here's your little internet in a box for your smaller community. Um, so there's stuff like that that's been talked about that's definitely in kind of D-Web world for like just making my own little thing. So does that help at all with your question? <laughs> yeah, Michael, you got more? Um, you just reminded me, and this is probably even further away, uh, Dietrich, from your question, uh, but a really interesting problem that kept coming up, um, particularly in the designing a chat app, but just generally, um, Interesting that there is so much overlap between uh, like the progressive web app and the web development world and offline first. Um, I would have thought like native mobile developers who want to be able to be uh, offline first would be a more natural matchup. Um, but you get some interesting limitations like uh, like weird same origin policies if you are a web app that is not a mobile app. Um, certain APIs aren't available to you. Um, you are otherwise limited and, and further sandboxed. Um, so you get uh, issues accessing all the cool device features, um, but kind of the mentality and uh, experience a lot of people who are interested in offline first is coming from the web dev world. Um, and so something like a Node.js or those variants are more familiar than Kotlin or Objective-C and Swift or whatever. Um, so one, clearly Firefox OS should have taken over the world and that would have solved some problems. Um, but there's, there's a really interesting mashup and, and limit there of uh, motivated developers, but where the tech stack actually allows them to go 
even you know regardless of where they actually want to go. There's a, it's the misalignment there, I guess, um, and that surprised me. There was a specific chat about um, when would you not use a PWA. So it was like the distinctions between native and which I don't remember you being in, Michael. Were you there with me and I forgot you? Or you just heard about this in a different so. different conversation? Yeah. So it was um, like it seems like PWA would be the way to go because you're because it's so cross platform. So you're just making the thing once and then it is working in theory on many devices. But there were those little questions of what is actually <laughs> what 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 do you have access to in terms of device settings or information about the location that you're in? Um, I'm trying to remember there was an interesting quirk. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Uh, I'll add one more note. One of the bigger pain points um, is like app distribution. Um, so if you, uh, like Android, you can sideload apps. Um, and if I understand the process right, those uh, sideloaded apps can be um, built and distributed uh, by USB stick while um, uh, like PWA apps are limited as part of that same origin stuff. So I don't think you can, I forget the details, sideload them the same way. And so uh, even if you can get the tech stack working on the web, kind of native React, whatever that is, um, it becomes untenable if you ship 1.0 to the field and 1.1 needs to happen a week later. And that's touching hundreds or thousands of devices to manually do the, the side loading again rather than be able to propagate it over a network somehow. Um, real big pain points that are gonna need to be addressed somehow. Sorry, quick question. So if you have this network of devices that they connect with each other, right? The update or the, even the application itself, why can you not propagate it this way? I'm going from memory, so I'm definitely forgetting uh, the, the details. If it's a native app and sideloaded, you can distribute that app like a zip file, and I believe Android will handle it and be able to let you install it normally. If it's a PWA, um, again, I think it's the same origin issue, but I could be confusing conversations. Um, but they are, are handled separate. Oh, they, I think it's tied to an SSL cert. So you think you need to make a web request to, uh, thank you, uh, to a, a DNS record that has the SSL cert, which you're local phones probably not going to have unless it's jailbroken and you've done a bunch of setup. Um, so in a PWA world, you need to authenticate against the cloud uh, to be able to pull that down. Um, whereas a native app, it's a signed bundle. And so you can move that around however you want to move bits around. Exactly. If it's a signed uh, bundle, so, so it's about data authenticity, isn't it? Absolutely. The majority of the developers, though, aren't fans of native, and they come from a React world uh, and want to use a, a PWA or a web stack. They don't want to learn Kotlin or Swift or whatever that, and then implement their apps. Um, maybe it's the right solution on a technical level, but in terms of like friction getting started, they want to live in a PWA web stack world and have the benefits of native. So there's yeah, okay. yeah there's just a push and pull there. Yeah. yeah. Dietrich, there's a lot of nodding. Do you have anything to contribute to this? Well, yeah, so I mean, we hit we hit the wall with Firefox OS, and and we had to basically invent packaged apps, which were a zip file filled with your web app and your manifest, and then signed to be able to get that that side load ability, and to be able to get away from that same origin restriction, the point at which the install flow and update flow happens through that dedicated network connection through a browser. So. In order to achieve that APKness that so much of the developing world you can go up to the corner, get a uh, SD card that's loaded with 300 apps, just dump it on your phone. Um, they're all pre-signed, et cetera, or, or not as often as the case as well. Uh, so a lot of times the sideloading, you're throwing away a lot of those, part of those privacy and security restrictions anyway. So the authenticity isn't necessarily guaranteed because it's a binary that you got from a strange SD card and put on your device. <laughs> so there's a little bit of like the mirage of security there, especially in the side loading instances. Um, but the, the use case, the need of the use case tends to trump that in the field. So, and the, from the web standpoint, they've, the entire model has hinged every bit of trust 
in that same origin policy and the SSL cert chains. And it, I, 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 so a lot of times to the detriment of adoption in these types of offline use cases. Um, storage is a good example. So some of the constraints that you're talking about around uh, native versus web are around storage. Even in JS IPFS, we do we basically build a local data store inside of a web page that is blown away completely if you hit storage quotas because we don't want to ask for permission to have more storage. So we've traded off the persistence of that data for a perceived user experience problem around having to ask permission for something from a web page. So we've taken that choice away from the user in that case. And that is a side effect of the permissions model that the web uses in order to determine capability. Uh, and, and now that, that they're leaning even further and further into that model in terms of uh, contemporary web standards development. I remembered the thing I had forgotten about the conversation about like when you would use PWAs versus native. Just thinking about it, we were originally assuming that um, when you're using a native app, you know, there are certain places in the settings of your phone where you can go and see like the data usage from a specific app and you have a list of all the apps. And we had been assuming that maybe with a PWA, which is really running in a web browser, even though that's hidden from you, that it would come, that it wouldn't show as its own usage. But somebody during the session pulled it up and did see the things they knew to be PWAs coming up in that list, which was interesting. So I'm not positive whether that is universal or is specific to the kind of device they had that it was treated that way. The, uh, some so newer Android devices, I think from I can't remember which version on show Chrome-based PWAs in the app installed applications list. Cool. But if you have any other browsers, PWAs they don't show up. Gotcha. Any other questions about some of the topics that we threw out here? I would be curious, <laughs> Michael's head is gone, but I would be curious, Michael, if you walked away with any ideas for like gaps that IPFS could help fill or like tweaks that could be made to IPFS that would make it more useful for these kinds of use cases? Uh, yeah. Um, Sergeant, you need to let me do some things now. Sorry. Um, so there, there have been some tickets about this on the IPFS repo. Um, it's probably reasonable to say that IPFS is not an offline first app. Um, and I think there'd be some advantages to trying to do that. Um, how that skirts or addresses the like same origin PWA is a little blurry to me. Um, but it seemed like there's some advantages there of um, like being able to pin and resolve content when you're in offline mode for IPFS as a open bug, those sort of things. Um, when you, sorry, when you say offline there, you mean just not connected to any peers or how would you define uh, that? So in, <clears throat> so in IPFS, there's a proper offline mode. So like don't make network connections, but even in effectively offline where you are online, you can't connect to anybody. Um, the behavior is not the same between those two modes, even though gotcha. the user experience should otherwise be the same. Yeah. Okay. Um, Thanks. Yeah. Uh, and then, like, most of this has some technical, um, the technical side is not the hard part. The UX is by far the more tricky part of, um, like, breaking uh, walled garden monopolies, having an experience. Like secure scuttlebutt is a very popular thing in some of these conferences. Onboarding someone to secure scuttlebutt is a non-trivial thing, and there's a bunch of terms you need to know about, and like gigs of data needs to be processed between two users. If like a more seasoned user says, "Hey, let me join you to my um, whatever scuttlebutt averse and and do all those things," um, so like the technical side is not there, but it is relatively close. Like you can make it work with some issues of API compatibility and stuff. What is not seemingly there is the UX um, and kind of terminology and design language for what it means to do that stuff. Um, and then like, you just need to be aware of all this so that the user knows, oh, it's failing because there's a bug, not it's failing because it thinks it's online and it isn't or whatever. So there, there's too much state the user needs to maintain to be able to have a, a, a reasonable experience using this tech. Um, 
Like, it is not, uh, pardon the phrase, but, like, mom-friendly or, like, uh, tech-illiterate friendly, um, though it totally could be. Like, all the pieces are there. Um, it is not, have, not has, has not been built yet that way. Yeah, one of the things that came up in that UX discussion was on a, the, the thing I call the normal internet. Uh, when, you, when you're having a computer problem, they're often like the diagnosis tools. They're like, okay, try this. Did it work? If not, this might be the problem. And I think if people were, people who were more familiar with DWeb than me were saying, okay, well, it could, this could be the thing that's the problem. It would be like, oh, you, you have 93 whatever's like, that doesn't mean anything to me as someone who's new to DWeb. Like you need to take it one step past where you think it is and like, what is the implication of that? What should I do next because of whatever this random statistic is that you're presenting to me that I don't understand? So is it that I need to, I don't have enough peers. My peers don't have the data. And like, I, I don't like right now, if I try to use a, try to find a tool that I know is at some link on the gateway and it's not there, my best troubleshooting is like going in Slack to my colleagues and saying, can anybody else get this thing? I don't know how to tell who's like whose fault it is that I can't get the thing. Um, so I think there's a lot of just want a second, like the vocabulary, not just for offline first applications for IPFS or DWeb stuff. But for me, the vocabulary for DWeb stuff in general is very inaccessible, very hard, very unfamiliar. It needs a lot of work to come down to like, normal human I don't mean English as opposed to Spanish I mean English as opposed to tech jargon um it's that's one of the biggest things I see um that prevents me from just being super excited about dweb stuff it's like it's not it's not accessible you can't onboard people if it's not accessible <laughs> to understand how to get started we've been having the same conversation in how we kind of package up browser related features for IPFS. Like there's a lot of things that we can do that align with, with that, that meet a lot of really common offline or partial offline use cases. Um, but, and some of the stuff that, that Lytle has in the agenda you know, is a reflection of these conversations that we've been having. And from a, from a UX standpoint, like the, the work that we've done so far and things like IPFS Companion or desktop are really oriented around IPFS as a technology and people who are IPFS core contributors or technical users, but not around the things that people need to do if they want to save, share, publish, read those core use cases. So when people are looking for something that I want to be able to save my Wikipedia pages offline and share them, they don't Google IPFS. They, search, share, or save Wikipedia, right? And so the, the idea of having those use cases first and foremost as an entry point into that world and being oriented around the needs of the people that, that want to be able to do those things as opposed to being the flipping it and having technology first like we have right now. I like that really idea. For adoption. Yeah. Um, anything else on the camp subject or shall we scoot on to one of our other items on the when's agenda? The, when's the next one? We don't know. Uh, <laughs> we are not that far along. And we have a, we're, we, we need more help. Uh, we, we need more humans involved to make these things happen. This is, as we emphasize, a giant labor of love with uh, people's time getting pulled in different directions. So um, if anyone is interested in helping to participate, that would be great. And one need that the community has in particular right now is we have a lot of authors assigned for these articles on Medium and we don't have enough people who have time to cat herd and follow up with those folks. So that's one thing, anybody watching this, if you'd like to volunteer to be an official cat herder for the Medium publication, please let me know. Um, and I could give you all the training. I have lots of experience with cat herding. Um, yes, but I will keep you posted and there is, I can add a link in here, there's a, like a sign up thing on type form where you can leave your information so that we would be able to reach out to you as soon as the next event is scheduled. And we also always make an announcement in our medium publication. So subscribing to our medium publication would be another way to ensure that you got notified when that's happened. But you personally, Dietrich, I will make sure you know when this will happen. Yeah. And obviously I will tell people on this call. 
Um, Dietrich, do you want to jump over to your topic quickly? I don't know what the length of your and Lytle's topics are. Yeah, so. Sure. So my, my, totally unrelated, actually. Yeah, my, mine will be real short. Um, so I'm on the technical um, advisory board for Physicians for Human Rights. Uh, it's an organization that um, does a lot of work in a lot of different countries around making sure that people have access to uh, medical care and they work with uh, governments and NGOs. Uh, and one of the projects that they have right now is a project called Medicapt, which is a, a, initially just started out as a set of printable PDFs uh, for documenting um, when there's an intersection between uh, doctors in the field that there needs to be an intersection with the criminal justice system. So a lot of times these are um, things like uh, sexual abuses and things like that that are happening. The two countries where they've kind of piloted this work, uh, I think was Ghana and Ethiopia, and um, they have now developing and funding for an application to be able to um, work, to be able to record evidence from that needed to get from doctors into the criminal justice system in these countries. And they are very unique offline requirements for this. So it needs to be things like a lot of times it needs to be uh, encrypted. A lot of times it needs to be able to be passed between multiple messengers without them being able to see the contents necessarily. Uh, and it uh, almost they, almost all of the time, these are situations where um, internet access is, is not available in large parts of an average and regular day. Uh, things like um, also in infrastructural requirements like we were talking about earlier, things like uh, not uh, no power and things like this. Um, very slow, slow connections, if any connection. Um, so it's a in very interesting set of requirements and I thought I would, you know, put this in front of the offline first community since there might be people who are both maybe aligned with the, the values of the organization, uh, physicians for human rights, but also interested in the technology as well. That's it, thanks. Very cool, thank you. Lytle, what do you have for us today? Uh, some quick updates. And looking at the time, I will make them extra quick. We can also give you more time on a future meeting if you want to go into anything oh, in more depth it's, later. It's, so. it's totally designed to be a very quick update because uh, okay. going like uh, in order, the very first two items are just uh, shout outs that there's ongoing work which will land in companion soon. Uh, the first one is uh, making web UI available in offline environments. So when you install, I'll use Brave as a good example because in Brave we have embedded JSAPFS node. You don't need to install uh, any third party software. So the idea is when you install a PFS companion, you will have web UI pre-cached, so it will work in offline environment, uh, and also making the initial onboarding experience much more pleasant, because uh, it's already there, does not need to be loaded. It's 22 megs, so it's, the first initial load may take time, especially if your network is not uh, too fast. Um, the second item is uh, IPFS Companion, right now, is able to recover from some uh, broken links, uh, but there's a contributed PR, which is very close to uh, landing in the next companion. Basically, the idea is that companion is already identifying IPFS resources, uh, like content addressed things on websites. Uh, people run their own public gateways. Some people just use IPFS content addressing in paths on their websites. Uh, the problem is what happens if the gateway goes offline or uh, DNS gets censored or stuff like that. Uh, browser, like HTTP request will just fail even though the content is still available on IPFS network. So companion pretty soon will be able to recover from those specific error codes. When DNS lookup fails, when uh, like there's a server error or like content is blocked for legal reasons. Uh, there it will like seamlessly, uh, we plan to enable it by default. Uh, it will automatically try to recover uh, and open it from the public gateway. So it should work with our gateway uh, if user is not running local node. And if, it's, uh, if they are running 
uh, then it will automatically get redirected to local node. So you will not get blocked, you will not get censored, and even if like the service got, goes offline, those links will no longer be dead. Uh, so that's coming soon. I probably will demo those things uh, next time uh, we see on, uh, each other on this call. And uh, finally, I wanted just to mention there's an experiment in MFS-based co-hosting. So generally the idea is to leverage existing APIs, namely MFS, uh, existing IPFS APIs, and try to model a very simple protocol scheme and more like a set of conventions for co-hosting stuff uh, without any third party uh, applications or uh, new APIs. And uh, specifically to the discussion we had before on this call, uh, coming from the use case. So if you want to host Wikipedia, Wikipedia is like six, over 600 gigabytes English in Wikipedia. Unpack, when you unpack it without videos, just text and pictures, it's like 650 gigabytes in size. So not everyone is able to like host the entire thing. And if people visit a website uh, with like IPFS companion or other browser, which supports distributed protocols and how that person can opt in to contributing to co-hosting Wikipedia or to co-hosting a part of Wikipedia. So there's a discussion about concept call, I call it like lazy co-hosting. So the idea is that you could mark a website, let's say Wikipedia to be co-hosted and there would be two modes. Like one would be like the full copy, but that requires a lot of space and time to fetch it. Um, and the lazy mode is you are contributing, uh, you are co-hosting, but only the parts you already visited. It's sort of already built into IPFS. The only missing piece is keeping those blocks around, like pinning them or like implicitly pinning them. And that's what co-hosting spec is basically uh, providing a means of formalizing a way to uh, keep those blocks around uh, for uh, the websites that you care. And we have like a very early draft of the spec and eventually uh, we want to experiment in uh, what like implement UI, look uh, at ways uh, at the UX uh, in IPFS companion, uh, things like that. So uh, I posted the link there. Um, and um, sort of like a related link I dropped uh, related to discussions about like uh, audio based signaling and things like that. We have uh, on in the uh, LIPI2P notes repo, there's a issue where so we sort of like drop and maybe uh, look, take a closer look at some alternative discovery and transport protocols. I'm interested in, uh, especially for those things that could be implemented or work in web browsers. So uh, Vasco uh, looked at the where web Bluetooth spec is right now. Uh, and like we sort of identified missing uh, pieces. Uh, we also have like link to uh, audio uh, signaling for WebRTC. I believe we me, me, someone mentioned that a few weeks back on this call. Uh, so if you have any new links uh, over time, just that's the place when you can drop uh, drop them. And kind of related to PWAs uh, is uh, sign HTTP exchanges and bundle HTTP exchanges. So sign HTTP exchanges are for a is basically like sign, signing a specific uh, request and make it. it uh, decoupled from origin so you can transport it uh, by other means and load it into Chrome and it will show the proper origin. So it's a, like a way of distributing stuff uh, via sneaker net uh, without, without worrying about the TLS uh, thing that we, we discussed it before. So Chrome uh, is planning to implement bundled HTTP exchanges, which is, I believe, very relevant to PWAs. So you could like bundle all the resources, uh, wrap them in into this uh, bundle format. And when you load it in like mobile Chrome or desktop Chrome, it will look like it came over HTTP from remote server. But in fact, the, instead of like uh, HTTP over TLS, the signature was a part of the bundle. And there's an issue I dropped in the notes about like how, where we are so far with experimentation around uh, uh, signed and bundled uh, HTTP exchanges. 
Uh, bundle exchanges are interesting because like signing is optional and IPFS sort of like provides integrity guarantees already. So uh, there's like an open space for experimentation, I believe. Uh, I think that's it. Those are my updates. Any questions for Lionel? So many. <laughs> but we're out of time. Maybe next time. So speaking of next time, I looked at the calendar today. We usually have this on the third Wednesday of the month. And I realized that on the third Wednesday of, uh, of November, no one from Protocol Labs would be able to attend, including me. So I would propose, unless people know they have conflicts, that we do this one on November 13th instead of November 20th next month. Um, that keeps us away from both that conflict and the day before Thanksgiving. Um, so if I don't hear any strong objections, I will scoop that on the calendar. And as always, I, I um, create an issue for the meeting and feel free to drop ideas in there for topics you want to talk about next time. Lytle, if there's any of this that you want to go into in more detail, um, we'd be happy to have you do that. And then we got a really cool note from um, Nicholas Pace who's doing some cool stuff right now, which is why he's not here today. Um, so we will see what we have in store for us next time. But thank you everyone for coming and keep an eye on that Medium publication. We hope to have more on the session uh, summaries coming out soon. Also, people gave some quick passion talks. Some of them had to do with the web or offline first stuff and some of them had to do with completely random things, but they're all really cool. And some of the folks would like to share those videos with you and write some articles around them. So those things will also be in that publication. So keep an eye there. And if you see a topic there that strikes your fancy and you want to dig into further, that you want to propose for this call, just let me know and we can try to make time for that. Thanks everybody. Thank you, bye-bye.